Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Mark. My name is Mike, and today we are joined by someone brand new, Alex Kurtz. Hello, I'm Alex. I've been going to SMLC since I was a wee little lad all the way down in preschool, and now I am off to college at ASU. Go Devils. So, so grown up. Well, one of the things that we have done this past month is that we have done a back to school drive for Arizona Helping Hands. And Arizona Helping Hands is actually a ministry uh, next door to us. And uh, really it's for kids that are entering into foster care. And so we've collected a lot of items for those kids. And so here, take a look. Here's a couple pictures of some of the kids that were able to benefit and they were able to pick up their items this week. So with all that, we just simply say, Thank you. But that's not all that we're doing here in the month of July. What else is happening, Alex? So July 20th through the 30th, the parking lot is going to be closed. That's right. We will not have a parking lot. Instead, construction teams are going to be coming through. They're going to be tearing up all that pavement, laying some fresh new uh, parking lot down for us. So A, I now don't have to go through any more potholes, and B, I won't have to be popping any more tires. Whoa, 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 Alex, Alex, all right. We've already been through this, right? Our legal team said that there's no evidence that your flat tire is because of our parking lot, all right? Yeah, but anyways, continue. Yeah. <laughs> and then starting August 7th, we're, we are gonna be going back to three services. That's right, we're going back to the OG schedule, three services at 8, 9.30, and 11 a.m. That's right, Alex. You know, I'm really looking forward to it because, you know, especially at 10 o'clock, I mean, it's really grown. It's exciting. Uh, really, all of our services have grown, but you feel it the most at 10 o'clock because, well, everyone's just shoved together like that. And sometimes it can just feel very unwelcoming. And so what is exciting is that starting on August 7th here, that we're going to be able to space out, that we're going to have lots and lots of room for our guests. And so for anyone that you invite, it'll feel very welcoming for them and so we're gonna look forward to that. And then also we're gonna have our children's programming at 9.30 and then also at 11 o'clock because our children's messages have gone so well this month of July that one of the things we thought would be a nice way to make our 11 o'clock more family friendly is by having some children's messages. So that's not starting this week but rather it is starting on August 7th, so mark your calendars and plan accordingly. Uh, but Alex, also people want to know, how can I stay connected? How can I find out more info about all these things? Yeah, for sure. So go ahead, go ahead and check that bulletin. Hopefully you guys grabbed one on the way in. There will be a welcome card in there. And then if you guys have any prayer requests, go ahead, feel free, fill out that prayer card. We would love to go ahead and support you guys. That's right. And if you're joining us online, then you could do that anytime at our website, which is stmarkphx.org. And especially if you go to this QR code right here, you can scan that in and, and you can fill out that welcome card, the prayer card, a place to drop off your offering. And today is really exciting because we are in this series that is going to be on questions that I've always wanted to ask God. And today we're going to be hammering on one of the ones that I know that I've asked and I've heard so many people ask, which is simply this. If there is one God, then why are there so many religions and really can one religion be right we're going to talk about all that so with that go ahead let's silence our cell phones and let's go ahead and let's stand and begin worship
We begin our time this morning in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, for he has forgiven the iniquity of my sin. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, justly deserved your present forever. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent to them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, poor sinful being. Amen. Well, God's love for you is deeper than the deepest ocean. It is higher than the tallest mountain. It will last longer than the universe we live in. Out of this great love, God made a way to cross the chasm that sin had left between him and us. He crossed it with the death of his very own son, Jesus, who offered his life as a ransom for yours. So hear these words this morning. Through faith in Jesus, you are forgiven of all your sins. In the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. you. Let us pray. O oh God, because you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding, pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us now confess together the words of the common faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. is from Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 12, 10. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, 
they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what he has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off all their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what he had been handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then he said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival of the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I can, commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading today comes from John, the 14th chapter. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where, where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. This is the word of the Lord.
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 is for the whoever's. Wherever you came from, whatever you've done, and whoever you are, I want you to know that according to John 3.16, right now you have an arms wide open welcome from God. Anybody, everybody, anywhere, whoever. John 3.16 isn't just for kids. It's for hurting mothers, broken fathers, and all of us. It isn't just for t-shirts and tattoos and bumper stickers and bookmarks. Because John 3.16 is not a decoration. It's a declaration. John 3.16 is an invitation to redemption, reconciliation, forgiveness, and eternal life. John 3.16 reminds us that the story of God isn't about a few special people making it up to God, but God making his way down to the rest of us, to the whoever's. John 3.16 is what God thinks about you. You are loved, welcomed, valued, seen, and you are invited. You are not half-loved, you are not unseen, and you are not forgotten. John 3.16 is for the whoever's. John 3.16 is for you. John 3.16 is for me. Well, amen is right, actually. <laughs> thank, thank you, for Alice, for saying that. Yeah, you know, um, so today we are going to be looking at this whole theme of uh, really just Jesus coming for us, to rescue us, and why that's so important, especially whenever there's so many other religions out there. We're really going to be taking a look at this question of if there is only one God, then really why are there so many other religions out there? And I know that this is a question that I've had. This is a question that, that I'm sure that you've had. This is a question that for sure your, your friends, your neighbors, the people that you work with, family members have all had. And these are all things that come up so often whenever we're in youth groups and whenever we're in Bible studies. And so today we're just going to be really focusing on, on that question. Why is that? How can this be? And so we're going to start off with a couple memes. So one of the things that I do is um, I scroll through social media, and I swear, I don't know why I do it, because so often it just raises my blood pressure. Um, I have friends of mine who I purposefully uh, keep as friends and I follow uh, who wildly disagree with me about everything. And again, I don't know why I do it. It raises my blood pressure. But I do it because I want to see what, what other people have to say. What is their reasoning for thinking? And so I'll just show you this uh, meme right here. I see this one from time to time. It says, thousands of religions in the world, but only your God saves? Wow, you are a lucky one. <laughs> and it really does kind of bring up this question. Well, as Christians, we proclaim that Jesus is the only way. We just read that in the book of John. And, and really, wow, you're the lucky one. And so let's go to this uh, next one here. And so this one is kind of interesting. It says, your religion is not the true one. Your religion is just the, the local one. And, and really, you know, in there on the side here, I know you can't read that, but it's their key where it shows how uh, religions are simply geographic. And actually, I'm going to disagree with this because I do think that this was true uh, 50 years ago or uh, maybe 100 years ago and certainly 1,000 years ago before there was really this area of globalization, before people could just swipe their credit card. I mean, what a day we live in, you guys. I mean, right after the service, you can go swipe your credit card, hop on a plane, and you'll be on the other side of the world tomorrow. I mean, really, what a day we live in. And, and so whenever I see this, actually, statistically, this is just not true. Um, because if you were to look at America, even, uh, 50, well, I say 50, I keep forgetting that 50 years ago was the 70s, all right? But uh, you go back even further, the 1950s especially. So let's go back, what is that, 70 years ago, post-World War II era. Um, really, that was, it, at least percentage-wise, that was really the height of Christianity in America. Over 90% of people 
said that they believed in Jesus, and they actively went to, to church on Sundays. I'm sure that if you're around, you remember, at least you can remember the culture where on Sunday mornings, things just shut down. I mean, the only thing we have these days are Chick-fil-A <laughs> that's, that you can't get on Sunday, but, but the whole culture would shut down. Everyone would be in church. In fact, if you were to ask people, hey, what is your religion? What they would say is, they would not say even that they're a Christian, although they would maybe say that, but really the big distinction was, well, I'm a Lutheran, well, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Baptist. And so all of your friends, your neighbors, the people that, that you worked with, that you went to school with, uh, the diversity was between Methodist and Baptist and Lutheran and Catholic. Uh, and then today, however, it is so much different. Today, if you show up at your workplace, you show up at your school, it is not simply only Lutherans and Catholics and Baptists there, but rather it is that, that you could take all those people and, and it, they'll simply be a Christian. And then you'll also have someone who is Jewish, someone who is Muslim. And so, so really with globalization, this is just statistically just inaccurate, actually. Um, but one of the rising categories when, when they do the surveys and they knock on your door and say, okay, what... What faith are you? What religion do you believe in? Um, you know, there is one category that has been on the rise for years. In fact, in Arizona, just this past year, it, it became the number one religion. Do you guys know what it is? It's the nuns. Now, whenever I say the nuns, I am not talking about our, our Catholic sisters, okay? Instead, I am talking about the N-O-N-E, the nuns. And what they'll do is they'll just simply look at it and they'll say, you know, even between Lutheran, Catholic, Baptist, or Methodist, or Christian, or Protestant, or Jewish, or atheistic, instead they'll just look at that and go, nah, actually, I'm not really any of these things. I'm, I'll just check the, I'm nothing, no box, the nun. And the nuns have actually become the number one religion in Arizona. Isn't that fascinating? And I can tell you that that's, that's certainly true in my life. Whenever I think of people who have left the faith, who have left Christianity, um, whenever they, they leave Christianity, they don't typically go to another major world religion. I can think of a handful of examples in my lifetime. I know a lady who went uh, from being raised as a Christian and she married a guy who is Orthodox Jewish. She now believes in it and she teaches her kid Orthodox Judaism. But that is the exception. Just about everyone else who I know who has left the church would fall under the nun category. And instead what they are is, is maybe, they, maybe they do show up here, uh, even in this particular sanctuary. Maybe they tune in online uh, from time to time. But they would do it in kind of this fashion. It would be more like, well, it's Mother's Day. Mom really wants us to go to church. Ah, you know, I'm not really into it. I don't really believe it, but ah, I'll go. All right? Um, that's the nuns that we're talking about. Now, the good news is the nuns have a church background. They either grew up going to church every week. Maybe they went to youth group. Maybe they just attended a VBS. But either way, the nuns often have a church background and are actually pretty open to Christianity, which is all very very, very good things. But just to recognize that that is most of the religion in Arizona today. How fascinating is that? All right, so we're going we're gonna to take a look here um, at this, this whole idea of, of why are there so many different religions. And one of the things that I've also heard people say in Bible studies and youth groups and social media is, well, maybe... It's like this. Maybe there's one God. We get that, all right? There's one God. But, you know, whenever someone is praying to Allah, whenever someone is, is bowing down and, and, you know, praying to this kind of spiritual force, that's this impersonal force that's in Buddhism, maybe they're also praying to the same God that we pray to. Maybe, maybe. And that's a thing that I hear so often. In fact, you'll say things like, uh, well, <laughs> even... Madonna and Oprah and Bono have all said these things with the coexist movement. They would say, well, maybe it's like a mountain and all roads just lead to the same path or the same destination. They all different paths. They look different, but they all end up at the same destination. 
Uh, or it could be like, well, maybe there's like multiple faces of God. And, and who are we really as Christians to know who the true living God is? You know, aside from like him telling us in the Bible, right? But, <laughs> but it would be that. Like, who are we to really know who, who the true living God is? And so whenever we worship our God, maybe it's the same God that other people worship too. They just, we just use different names. After all, Allah is simply the uh, Aramaic word for God. And so maybe we're all just worshiping the same God. So that's one thing that I hear quite often. And we're going to look into that. But first what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time really just kind of understanding things from God's perspective. <laughs> all right? We're going to really take a look at what the Bible has to say about his story, history, about his story. What is God's story? So the first thing that we're going to look at here, this is our next slide, is that there is one God. So for those who say that there is one God, many pass, well, they got the one thing right, all right? There is one God. But the difference is that this one God who exists is supreme. So there are not many gods, but there are rather one God. Now, if we look back at Old Testament times and really New Testament times too, where there's there's paganism, they call it polytheism, where there's the worship of many gods. So like in the land of Canaan, they would worship all of these different gods. And sometimes in these areas, there would be one god who's kind of more supreme than the others, who's a little bit higher up on the totem pole than some of the others. So for Canaan, it would be Baal for Egypt, it would be the sun god Ra. And if you think about that, of course they would worship the sun god because after all, the sun is what creates life, really. It's what creates uh, harvest and food and not just warm weather, but it creates and sustains life. And so for Egypt, they position Ra as like one of the higher up gods. But the thing is, in these pagan religions, there is still multiple, multiple gods. In fact, if you go back, and you could do it this afternoon, thanks to the World Wide Web, you can go back and read some of these ancient myths, and one of the things you're going to find is that these gods are, by and large, very, very weak. And so they're up in either heaven or maybe they're on earth, but they're always fighting with each other. And they're very petty, and they're manipulative, and they, they're weak. You can manipulate them. You can take them down. And, and that was the depiction of gods. Back then, they would have multiple gods, the sun god, the god of the harvest, the god of the moon, the god of the ocean. They would have all of these gods. And one of the things that we find consistently throughout the Bible is that all that's false. There are not multiple gods, but rather there is simply one god, and he is supreme. He is the god of everything. So if we take a look at this verse here from the book of Genesis, this is the first two verses of the Bible, and here's what it says. It simply says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And so what we see here is that in the beginning, God creates everything. And what was there? There was nothing. So out of nothing, God created everything. This is different than today. Whenever we say we made a house, what we did was we took we took existing material and we restructured it. We reformed it into a house. God took nothing and made and spoke and made everything. In fact, um, one of the things that just astounds me about God is just this very concept about how he has created everything. This is how supreme, this is how powerful, this is how amazing God is. In fact, as humans, we cannot possibly get our mind around what all God has created. In fact, this past week has been a very, for you fellow space nerds here, uh, there's, this has been a very interesting week. We've gotten some pictures from the James Webb telescope. And so, like, for example, we have this one right here. I mean, how, how astonishing is this? This is something that, that is light years away, and yet God has made this. And this is these images that we keep getting back are just more stunning than the next. If we go to the next one here, we'll see that, that each one of these, uh, the red dots that are in a little bit of, a, of an oval shape, those are galaxies. I mean, how astonishing is this, that God has created all of this, and as humans, we can't even wrap our mind around this. In fact, they're saying that these are, these are billions of light years away. And I can't not wrap my head around that. Although someone else posted this on Facebook, uh, they just simply said, well, maybe it's just a countertop, you know. So, so I'm, 
I'm a little skeptical these days. We don't really know what is what, is what okay? But we see this. We see this with God. He is supreme. There's one God. He is supreme. We got that, all right? Let's go to the next point here, and it's that Satan is the enemy. Satan is the enemy. So we have God. We also have Satan. Satan is our enemy. Um, and there is spiritual warfare between God and Satan. In fact, we see this all throughout the Bible where where there's a war, and Satan wants you, by the way. He does. He wants to attack you, and he wants to destroy you. These are really, really bad things. We should pay attention. Uh, if we look, for example, at Genesis 3.1, we get a description of Satan. It says, now the serpent was more crafty. So if you're taking notes here, circle or highlight the word crafty. And isn't that such a description of Satan? He is crafty. Ooh than any other beast of the field. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you know, I mean, did God, mm, did he really say that? Did he actually say that? That you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And so what we see here with Satan is that he's got a strategy to destroy you. And his first strategy, his same tactic, the guy has one playbook, he's been doing it for millennia, and it's simply to get you to doubt God's word. Did God really say isn't that something that you've said to yourself over the years? Isn't that something that whenever you're sharing the gospel with someone or you're sharing a hard truth with someone, they say, yeah, I know it's in the Bible, but I mean, come on. Did, I mean, God doesn't really mean that today, does he? And that's a tactic that Satan uses. Then he goes on and he makes a very deliberate false promise and a lie that, no, you're not going to die. You will surely live. He makes this false promise. He tells you a lie. And for the woman for Adam here, they ate the fruit. And, and they, as a result, did die, it turns out. Um, and so the thing with Satan that we have to realize is that there's one God. He wants, he's created everything, and he wants what's good for us. And then there's Satan, and he wants to destroy us. All right, so then we go to the next thing here, and it's that mankind often rejects God, and we worship idols. So because Satan is so crafty, he actually deceives many people into worshiping these idols and these false gods. In fact, what we had read just now in the book of Exodus is that God's people were in slavery. And just to imagine, like I, I really, if I could pick just about any time in the Bible to live, um, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if I want to be a Hebrew uh, s slave because that just sounds awful. But it might be worth it to see the plagues in Egypt because that was God flexing his muscles in a way that he has never done before and really hasn't done since. A way that he was able to show the largest, most powerful civilization and army in the world at that time. And Pharaoh, who thought himself to be a god, that it was a showdown where God really showed who is supreme. And get this. They are freed from their slavery. They walk on dry land. They get to the other side. Moses goes up the mountain to receive the law. And what do they do? Here's this verse. It says, Aaron said to them, Take off your rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So they just looted Egypt of, of some bling, of some gold. And then what? They're going to smelt it all down, and then they're going to proclaim that this is the true living God who has rescued you from Egypt. Not the true living God, but these things that you took out of your ears, that's the thing that has delivered you from Egypt. And we look at this today and we say, what nonsense. And it is, and rightly so, we can proclaim that it is. But... Don't we do the same thing? Rather than worshiping the true God, don't we instead create these idols in our lives, false gods that we bow down and worship, either literally or figuratively? And that's the thing with the nuns. The nuns would say, I don't worship any God. And I would say, yes, you do. You worship yourself. Because, think about it, if, if if you are the God of your own universe and you get to call the shots, you get to decide what's right or wrong, you get to decide what you're going to do, guess who is God of your life? You. And so really for the nuns, it's not that they have no religion. 
Actually, it's the opposite. They completely have a religion where they are at the center and they are the most important thing in the universe and they worship themselves. And that's exactly what the people of Israel did thousands of years ago whenever they bowed down and worshiped and said, this is the God who has saved us. In fact, there's the whole self-help industry out there today. And what I love about the self-help industry is that they keep making new books. You know why? Because the one 10 minutes ago didn't work. You know why? Because it's all about self. If you're going to rely on your own inner strength for help, it's not going to work. It's not going to last long. And so it's a very profitable industry to be in, but it does not work. Instead, to rely on the true living God. All right. So then also, remember this. There is only God and Satan. There's no other gods. And because of that, here's the thing. Worshiping false gods in this particular case is not actually this. Um, we we, we kind of fancy words today, don't we? We say things like, oh, this person is practicing their religion. They are worshiping their gods. They are finding spiritual fulfillment. And actually, as Christians, now that we have this perspective, we could look at that and say, no, actually, they're not worshiping this false, or excuse me, they are worshiping a false god. But this false god's not even real. If they build a statue and they worship it, they're, they're not worshiping this god that they think exists. But actually, what they're doing is it's idolatry. Instead, they are worshiping Satan. Because if you're not worshiping God, because there's only two out there, if you're not worshiping God, then what are you worshiping? You're worshiping Satan. And so here's the thing. Because we are lost, and because we choose to do evil and we're separated from God, God who is holy cannot be with unholy, and therefore he has to create a path for us to be reconciled with him. There needs to be a way that we can be saved, that we can enter into heaven. And how he did this, of course, is with Jesus. This is our next point here, is that if we look at the biblical timeline, God creates everything good, humans mess it up, we worship false gods and idols, and yet God so loved the world, which is our video, John 3.16 he loved us so much that he sent Jesus. And so, so get this, guys, that the God, he could have just simply condemned us. And it's what we deserve. It's what we would have absolutely deserved. Because we have rejected God. We've worshipped these other things rather than the true living God. As the wages of sin is death. So we deserve hell. We deserve eternal condemnation. And yet, God loves us so much that he even was willing to sacrifice his one and only son. And I say sacrifice because it was indeed a sacrifice on the cross. And so, Jesus even says this in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so, it is not through Allah. It is not through this impersonal spiritual force that is in Buddhism. And it is certainly not one of the 330 million gods, last I counted, in Hinduism, all right? But instead, it is simply through Jesus. It is simply through Jesus. And so whenever I hear people say, well, you know, maybe it's the multiple faces of God, and whenever they are worshiping this thing or that thing, maybe they're also worshiping Jesus. And what would Jesus have to say to that? He would say, no. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other name under heaven to proclaim other than the name of Jesus. And so we have to call it what it is, that it is a contradiction. That, and this is true, you can even think of it this way. And, and whenever we look at, at Judaism, for example, in Judaism, there is one God, Yahweh. In Islam, there is Allah. And even though that they sound similar and they're translations of the same word, they are completely different. The way that the, way that the Quran describes Allah is drastically different than the way that the Old Testament describes Yahweh. In Buddhism, there is no God. Hinduism, there's 330 million gods. And so the question then quickly becomes, well, who's right? Either there's no God, or there's 330, or there's one God. But as Christians, we have this completely unique. No one has this. We have the Trinity. We have one God, three persons. Figure that out. All right? 
No one else, no other religion has anything close to that. And so they cannot all be right. One has to be right. And as Christians, whenever we look at the biblical story here, we see that, that it's us who deserve hell, and yet God loves us so much that he even sent his son to save us. And yet, even though that God has laid down his life for us, and yet, our next point here is that people still reject Jesus. So the saga continues. I wish this was over. I wish that people would simply look at Jesus and say, okay, yes, you came to this earth to save us. We believe in you, end of story. But actually the saga continues. All throughout the Bible, people still rejected Jesus. We saw this uh, not only after Jesus was crucified and was risen from the grave and the disciples went out to tell everyone, um, even, even at that point, the Pharisees saw the empty tomb and they couldn't find his body. And they, they, they all knew. In fact, they even had a secret meeting that said the guards came and told what had happened. They're confronted with the truth. And yet, even when they're confronted with the truth, the answer is, yeah, but I still don't, I still don't believe it. How insane is that? The Pharisees, the Jewish people at the time, certainly rejected Jesus. But also, uh, one of my favorite stories, Paul, he goes to these Greek philosophers when he's going to Athens. Because Paul, what he did was, he uh, was saved on the road to Damascus, and, and he wanted to go and tell everyone about Jesus. So he did these missionary journeys. So he went to Athens, and there's this Mars Hill and there's this area where all these top Greek philosophers of the world are meeting. And they're pontificating and discussing and philosophizing, all right? Kind of picture like the Stoic Greek guy like this and like this, all right? That's what they're all doing. And Paul was actually invited to speak the gospel. What an incredible moment. Can you imagine? And he did. He got up there and he proclaimed the gospel and yet, as he proclaimed the gospel, here's what it says in the book of Acts. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Can you believe that? But others said, we will hear you again about this. But some men joined him and believed. And so there was three different reactions from these philosophizers. All right? One is to make fun of Paul and say, that's ludicrous. We're not going to believe it. Others were interested. Said, okay, you have my attention. Tell us more about it. And other people believed right then and there. And so I give you this as a little bit of comfort because sometimes whenever you share the gospel, you can today get all three of these reactions, sometimes at once even. Some people will say, nah, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to believe it. Other people are curious and some people will believe. And that's what happened to Paul. And Paul, was, he, was a good, he was a good missionary. And even he got rejected. In fact, he got rejected a bunch. He, he was ran out of town as people were throwing bricks at him. Um, and, and so, <laughs> it's just fascinating that people still reject Jesus. They did back then and they do today. So, if we look at the conclusion of the Bible, the book of Revelation, one of the things we're going to see here is that there is a final end of the story. And there is a final home for us as humans. And it's simply one of two places. Not three, not five places, but one of two places. And it's simply heaven or hell. In fact, what Jesus, he even goes on to describe this. And he says, he says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to what? To destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So Jesus here is talking about how in the end, and we're all on one of these two paths here. But in the end, one is going to lead to destruction, and one is going to lead to life. And so the wide path is one that many people are on. But he is saying instead, enter by the narrow gate. And, and really, whenever we look at this concept of hell, it's, it's one that, as Christians, that we don't want to think about very much. And we're uncomfortable by but Jesus, he talks about it a whole bunch, doesn't he, in his ministry? In fact, he referred to it as the burning trash dump that was outside of Jerusalem. He said there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some people actually, I swear, I've heard people say this. They say, well, you mean to tell me there's a place where no Christians and no gods there? And I say, yeah. <laughs> they say, all right, it's going to be a party. 
Absolutely not. They are going to be in for a shock. They really are. And yet it also just shows how hard some people's hearts can be. So really, one of my favorite things is, is and this sounds kind of odd, but, um, and we've done it the past couple years more than we have any other time that I've been here, um, but we get to come together and we have memorials. We have celebrations of life. We have funerals. And, and it really is such a very interesting thing to gather around someone who is a believer in Jesus. And we can just have that security knowing that they are in heaven, that there is no more pain, but rather that they are in their final home. They get to meet God face to face. That's how Revelation describes heaven, is that you actually get to meet God face to face. And so really, even though that we set out Kleenexes up front for the family, even though that we do that, and, and we, say good, we say not goodbye, but see you later, and we have that grief, and it's a real thing, but also, though, we have this comfort knowing that they're in heaven, that they're in heaven with Jesus. And it really is, as a result, just one of the most rewarding things that we do here. And so here's the thing, though, that oftentimes we, we also have a different circumstance. Sometimes there will be times in our lives that we look around at our friends, the people that we know, the family members who we care deeply about, and we actually see, as Jesus is talking about here, that they are not on the narrow path, but rather that they're on the wide path, the one that leads to destruction. And one of the really bizarre things that I hear people say is they say, yeah, I know that he's on this path and it's leading to destruction, but you know what? I'm sure that he's going to go to heaven. And I would say, well, why? And the answer is, well, because we can't really stand the thought of this person not being in heaven with us. And that's a real reality. And it should be, if you have a heart at all, all right, if you have one ounce of compassion in you, then that really should be something that drives you. It really should be something that, in fact, motivates you to share Jesus with this person, to love this person, to care for this person, to try to get them back into the kingdom of heaven, right? And so I'm just going to give you a couple very quick tips here. And these are right here on your notes. You can take them home, post them on your fridge, think about them throughout the week. Easy things to do here. But one of them is to simply let them know that you're a Christian. Now, how you do this, you could, I guess, say, hey, I just want you to know I'm a Christian. I guess you could do that. But what's even easier than that is things like if you're wearing a Christian t-shirt, all of a sudden it just opens up the door that says, oh, you let them know that you're a Christian. Very easy thing to do. Uh, other things could be, for example, whenever you're talking about your weekend and you would say, oh yeah, and blah, 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 at church on Sunday, da, 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 da. Think about all the things that you're doing. You're letting them know that you went to church on Sunday, that you believe in this. You're saying so many things with just one, one word, all right? So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Very easy thing to do. Another thing to do is to pray for them. And, and you should have a prayer list and keep Keep, keep praying for them. Submit those names right now even on your uh, prayer request and put it in the offering basket. We'll pray for them too. Um, also, not only pray for them just by yourselves, but it can also be a way in which that you pray with them. Uh, this happens especially during tragedy and crisis in our lives. Whenever we get to go to someone and say, hey, I know that you're going through this hard time or they're telling you about a hard time and say, you know what? can I pray for you? And just do it right then and there. You'll be amazed at how receptive people are, especially if they're in a time of crisis. Um, share online resources. So one of the things that St. Mark has done since COVID has that we have invested a ton into our online library. We have so many different sermons and music, and uh, Pastor John has his Through the Bible in a Year. There's so many different things that you could send on out. Now, I say our site, stmarkphx.org, yes, um, we certainly have many, but there are so many other websites too. Now, ours is better, of course. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but really, there are so many th things out there. There's Lutheran Hour Ministry. There's uh, even things like on Instagram. I encourage my teenagers to follow Tubby Mac. Every day he posts something that's encouraging. 
or insightful or challenging. I mean, there's so, so, so many things. You know, find, uh, you know, Rick Warren. You can sh retweet him every day. He's got something every day. I'm just saying there's so many different things out there that you could use that you could share with them. And then really another thing you could do, the last thing, uh, of course, is to invite them to church or a small group or an event. In fact, maybe this is even bumped up on the list, depending. You know, maybe we're doing something here. Uh, we're doing an event, and you say to yourself, hey, you know what, um, Joe would really like that. Go and text Joe and say, hey, Joe, you should come uh, to this event that we're doing. And so this is not in sequential order, but all of these things are very quick and easy things to be able to share your faith with them. And so really, I want to leave you with this. Just this whole concept that there is one God, all right? True living God is supreme. And really, everything else that people seek, it's, it's empty. It's void. It, it lacks the substance. It does not fill. We say that it has, we are all created with this God-shaped hole in us. And so in a minute here, Lisa's going to sing one of her songs. And I really just encourage you to use this song as a time to reflect and to, to really pray over these words that Lisa sings about how, how Jesus is everything, about how so many times that we go and we seek other things and, and we try to find fulfillment in other ways rather than going to God, but instead about how Jesus is everything. So with that, let's go ahead and let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We love you so much for being a God who is supreme, a God who creates everything, created the universe, even as we're seeing with the James Webb telescope. And Lord, also you're a God who knows us, who cares for us. Too often, Lord, we as humans have rejected you and we continue to do so today. And yet, Lord, we confess to you saying that we're sorry, that we need you in our lives. We recognize that you came to save us and because you came to save us, that today that we could receive through you and only you salvation. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. You are our everything. And all God's people said, amen.
Well, friends, I hope that today was insightful and meaningful. Hopefully that you grew in your faith, that you're challenged, and also that you had fun today. And so really, we just encourage you, if, if any part of this message was beneficial, go ahead and like and subscribe on our YouTube channel, and be sure to share it out to a friend of yours who you think would benefit from hearing this. So with all of that, in the dead of summer here, we encourage you to go with that and also to go with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And all God's people said, amen. We'll see you next week.